This uh, will be our last uh, official week going through the transubstantiation and the Lord's Supper in that regard. But if it, if it comes back, it, it probably will come back at some point in some form. Um, and if we have any more questions about that, um, we'd definitely love to go over that some more. But we, this is our fourth week, so um, we, uh, we left off on uh, number six. And this is really the crux of everything, which is Scripture's view of the, the Eucharist. Um, as we could use that term, if you, you know, Protestants can use the term Eucharist, it just means Thanksgiving in Greek. But as we've said, it helps to distinguish between the Protestant and the Catholic view of um, the Lord's Supper. So um, we want to look at Scripture today in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 especially. It's a text we read every month, so we're all very familiar with it. Um, but in light of the controversy of transubstantiation, it will be useful to look through that. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> And here are some questions, um, we'll read through it first, but here are some questions to think about as we read through it. Um, you can see in A, one, two, and th- sub point one, two, and three. Is, is Christ specially present in the Eucharist in a way that he is not at the preaching of the word, singing of songs, etc.? So when we go to take the Lord's Supper, is there a special presence of Christ that, um, that descends or that is, you know, uh, that manifests itself in, in that we don't have when we're singing songs. Maybe a, another way of phrasing that would be is the singing of a hymn or listening to a sermon, are those things less holy in some way than um, receiving the Lord's Supper? Um, are they acts of worship that don't have the same spiritual promise of Christ's presence? Is there anything in Scripture that would suggest that? And two, who examines the believer and makes him fit for participation? So this this question will make more sense as we go through it, but when you're participating in the Lord's Supper, um, from the Catholic view, remember that this is something that is done um, to a child. Now, most Catholics don't believe in paedo-communion. That might be the first time you've heard that phrase. You might have heard of infant baptism or paedo-baptism. Pado communion is actually a relatively rare practice, um, but it is sort of the logical extension of this, right? So if you're going to baptize children into the covenant and say that they are now Christians because by virtue of their baptism, um, why, wouldn't you, why wouldn't Christians receive you know, communion? Um, and I think, you know, I could be wrong on this. I, they have the infant communion, they have first communion, that sort of thing, or child's communion. I'm not sure what age that takes place in different ways. Um, they'll put the wafer on the tongue of an infant. Um, I'd actually have to research that more. Um, but among Protestants, even among those who hold to pedo baptism, pedo communion is exceptionally rare practice. So Protestants will make that distinction there. That's, um, but it's, it's worth bringing that up. Um, but who examines the, the child who is really not old enough to examine themselves? If they're, if they're receiving the the you know, sign and seal of the covenant uh, it, through baptism, in other words, shouldn't they also get the Lord's Supper? And then if they get the Lord's Supper, how can they examine themselves? So think about that as we read. And then, is it a fellowship meal or a ritual sacrifice? Does it lie on a spectrum between those two things? Uh, what was the context of the Lord's Supper originally in Passover? What was it in the early church with the apostles? And what, what do we do now? What do the Catholics do now, and what do we do now? Those are all things to think about as we read. Um, okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through 34. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe, I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? 
Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I just want to throw in a little interjection right there. It's really hard as I read that to see how this became the Roman Catholic Eucharist. This is a very straightforward... I mean, in one, in one sense, we know the history. We, we can see the steps along the way. But when you get back to the Bible, you're like, this is so simple. It's, so, it's, so, it's meaning is so plainly obvious to us. Um, and the things that are not said here are legion. They, 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 they add so much to the scripture, and that is the great thing that we need to guard against. Um, so that's just a comment there. Sorry to break it up. but Verse 27, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Uh, we pointed out to the youth group that there's a, a passage in James that's possibly connected to this one, where it says the prayer of faith will heal someone. Um, it's, it's likely that this is what it's referring to, is that um, sickness and even death was a punishment that God was using in the early church to, um, to punish those who were in, acting improperly. We see that with Ananias and Sapphira. It's, it's very likely that this is also taking place for those who were um, profaning the Lord's Supper by taking it lightly. Um, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged <clears throat> by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. <clears throat> now, you know, it's, so much of this is about hermeneutics, about how we interpret Scripture, how we read it plainly and normally. Let the grammar, let the history speak for itself. And, you know, you, you read this, and it's really hard to visualize a Roman Catholic uh, formal ritual where there's a representation of a sacrifice given through priests who are, um, as we saw, who are presenting an unbloodied sacrifice. Unbloodied is their way, is their asterisk on it to, you know, their loophole of saying we're not killing Christ again, as Hebrews uh, claims. The book of Hebrews asserts that they are killing Christ, re-crucifying him. But they're saying it's an unbloodied sacrifice. Well, you know, I read this as a simple person, and I receive this, you know, you know the, the original hearers of this see, okay, here's how we do this when we meet together for a fellowship meal. We're already having these fellowship meals probably every day that they would get together, um, every time they would gather together. They were meeting in homes often, um, and they would get together and have a meal of fellowship and of thanksgiving together, and that's where the idea of Eucharist came from. We're, we're getting together and blessing the bread and giving thanks. Um, and that isn't to say that, you know, when, when I, I certainly want, wouldn't want to say, as some do, that there's nothing more special um, about the Lord's Supper than getting together, Christians getting together and having a meal at Culver's or Applebee's or something like that, if you're praying, if you're fellowshipping. It is something more profound and more significant, and I would argue needs to have a little bit more ritual about it than, um, than simply that. But it's very much in the spirit of that. And I think it, it, it escaped that uh, atmosphere of togetherness and um, genuine love and fellowship that people had. And, and you, we can see even in the, the architecture of Roman Catholic churches, it became less we're all sitting together as a group and much more, you know, see the narrow aisles and people are, um, you know, I'm sitting, you know, 75 rows behind this guy in front of me. And um, we're all staring ahead at the altar 
and at the priest and at the host, in the, the host meaning the, uh, the bread in the center of everything. And, and uh, you know, the pulpit's off to the side if there is a pulpit. And um, it's all designed around this bloodless, quote unquote, sacrifice. It really does sort of bleach all of the, the fellowship, the genuine Christian love and fellowship right out of um, that, that together. It's a meal, you know, simply stated, it's a meal that we have together. Um, we could talk about our, our ceremony and what we do here in a traditional way. Um, there may be ways that we can improve it. Uh, I don't know particularly, but I think the spirit of what we have here when we partake together is the, is the important thing. Um, whether you have grape juice or wine, whether you have an actual loaf of bread or um, you know, pieces of styrofoam that last a lot longer <laughs> as we had during uh, COVID, um, you know, whatever the case may be, how you're doing it, again, it's not about the externalities. I, I keep using that word a lot these days. So it's not about the externalities. It's about the heart. And that's where Christ takes it. So, so let's just dive in the text here a little bit. Um, you know, verse 20, in verse 17 through 19, he's saying, there are divisions among you, and there have to be divisions. That's important because that's part of God's program for the church, that there are going to be factions. And we could do a whole um, lesson on that right there. This could be sort of the theme verse for our whole study, which is, you know, the word divisions means heresies. So in, in the Greek there, he's saying there have to be heresies among you. Um, the, these are nece a necessary part of how God is building his kingdom, and he's separating the wheat from the chaff and that. Um, and he's also strengthening brothers and sisters through, through their disagreements with each other, um, revealing who will be genuinely submissive to the word. Um, so he says in verse 19 that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not even the Lord's Supper that you eat. So he says this ritual you're doing, it looks like the Lord's Supper, it smells like the Lord's Supper, tastes like it, but it's not. You know, I believe Christ would look down at, the, at these um, empty rituals performed by the Roman Catholic Church and by other churches, by other Protestant churches, who don't have any love for the truth of God's word, and he would say, I, that's not even that. It's not even that. Um, you know, just as he said to the Jews, your, your sacrifices are meaningless. I know I commanded them. I know you're following the, the outward ritual to the letter of the law, but your hearts are far from me, right? You honor me with your lips. He, he acknowledges them. Yeah, you're giving me honor with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Um, so he's saying it's not even that. What you're doing is not the Lord's Supper, so don't, don't even you know, go down that route. You're not halfway there. <laughs> you're, you're not there at all. You start with the heart. Um, and what is, the, what is the charge that's laid upon them? Well, it's the, it's the, the partial, partialism. It's the uh, partiality. It's the um, gluttony. It's the lack of love. He's saying, you know, you despise the church when you, when you do this, when you act this way and take the Lord's Supper um, while treating your brothers and sisters this way. So what they were doing was, in the context is, you know, they were having large meals, um, but they would stratify. They would, they would gather together, and you had, in, in the ancient Greek world, you had slaves. A lot of slaves were in the church now. And, um, you know, Dave and I have often thought about this before, I'm sure some others. What if, what if one of the slaves was an elder? And then, uh, you know, maybe a rich man comes in, and he's underneath the elder. That that's, was Christ's kingdom, is that it was not um, based on how much money you had or what your social status was in life. Um, but a slave could be an elder of a church, and um, we, uh, we, but we see then that w when we gather together in the church, that there are no, even among elders, there's, there's no, elders are to be the, the servants of all. We're to be the ones washing the feet, right? And everyone is at the same level before Christ. There is no partiality. So you don't come in and bring your, bring your wealth and think that that's going to gain you uh, advantage in the church. Um, he, but they were doing that, they were stratifying, and then the rich would sit over here, maybe at the good tables, and they would get fed first, and then the poor last. And that was just an abomination to Christ, you can imagine. You know, Christ did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve. And he washed the feet at the Lord's Supper, and um, I think you know all of those, those things. So he, he's, he's mocking the idea there. It's like, don't you have 
houses you can go home and get fat and get drunk in? You, you can do this at home. You do this at home all, all week long, and then you come here for just a, a few hours together to be together, and you can't set aside your preferences then? Or do you despise the church of God if you are treating it, the, you know, the Lord's Supper that way? Now, that's not really the Roman Catholic problem per se, um, but it does lay the foundation for what Paul was saying here, which is um, the Lord's Supper is designed to be um, an equal participation before the Lord, and it's designed to center around the idea of love and community and um, togetherness. Because, I mean, what is the key, what is, think of what the table at the kingdom of God looks like when he says, I'm not going to drink this fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Is, is, is the table of the Lord going to have a, a VIP section, a rich person section, and a poor person section? No. You know, we will all be beggars before the Lord. And we will all be adopted children in his house. We'll all be equal. Jesus may, you know, he said there, are, there may be places of honor that he bestows upon people, his right hand, his left hand, etc. But um, we'll all know who we are, and there will be no boasting except in Christ in the, at the Lord's table in heaven. So when we meet here, and we often sing that song like um, the last verse looks ahead to um, uh, doing this at, at, the, at the Feast of Heaven. We'll join in the Feast of Heaven, you know. Um, we do this as a preparation, and as a remind, reminder to ourselves that that's what it will be like for eternity. Um, now, the familiar part that we, we know is verse 23, and this is really the crux of the historical Bap, uh, Lord's Supper debate. And Luther um, famously, Luther and Zwingli, the two, two great reformers there together with Calvin, uh, they famously had a falling out over this text right here. And Zwingli would hold something closer to our view, which is the memorial view, that the Lord's Supper is just a memorial. Um, there's nothing magic, well, that, let's not use that term. Um, there's nothing... Um, there's certainly nothing magical about it, but there's nothing um, mystical. There's nothing mystical about it. It is actual bread. It is actual wine or grape juice. It stays that way. Um, Christ is with us in his fullness, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit at all times. So we deny that there is, um, you know, a, a, the, the pr special presence of Jesus only coming at that time, and then as if he leaves when we're not doing the Lord's Supper. We deny anything like that. Um, it's a memory to us. It's a symbol. It's a sign. And Zwingli had that viewpoint, and Luther, uh, for all the good he did in the church, he couldn't get past the idea that somehow this was a mysterious um, presence of Christ in the bread and the wine, and that not the Catholic view of transubstantiation where the bread actually changes into actual flesh, but it spiritually changes into spiritual flesh so that you are consuming the spiritual flesh of Christ. And Luther pounded the table, and he, he actually wrote on the table. It was a very, very dramatic Luther thing to do. Um, they had a, a conference table that they were going to settle their disagreement, and he had, this is my body written on the table, um, the story goes, and it was hidden underneath the tablecloth. And when the right time in the argument came, he dramatically pulled the tablecloth and said, this is my body. That's what it says. And, and that hurt. And, uh, you know, but Luther, that was Luther. That was his personality. Some, some of us are Luthers and some of us are Calvins. And you know, Calvin was a firebrand too, but he was more cerebral. And um, some of us are, are fiery and some of us are gentle. And the Lord uses all kinds. Um, but Luther couldn't get past that, and he actually, um, sadly, I think he walked away from that meeting with Zwingli, thinking Zwingli wasn't saved. Um, it was that important to him. And so this, and, and that's Luther. And the Catholics burned people alive for denying transubstantiation. It was the number one reason that Protestant martyrs were killed, was for denying. It wasn't even denying the papacy. See, that's an interesting thing, because people in Europe kind of, everybody kind of knew the, the papacy had some real problems associated with it. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Eastern Roman Empire, had completely split off because they wouldn't acknowledge the Pope. Um, but what bound all Catholics together, Roman Catholics, was the transubstantiation, was the Mass. So even if they're like, eh, the papacy, okay, we could have some discussion there. Absolutely no discussion about this. If you deny that this 
wafer is turning into Jesus' body and you're consuming it, you are a heretic and you deserve death. And, and that's what they were burned for. Um, as a matter of fact, a couple of days ago was the anniversary of a, um, a famous uh, execution of uh, two men named uh, um, uh, Latimer, Hugh Latimer and, and Nicholas Ridley. And they were executed in, uh, under Bloody Mary, I believe, in England. And um, Hugh Latimer, there were two, two Protestant pastors who rejected the transubstantiation and were killed for it. And he had a great quote that I'm sure I'm going to butcher here, but um, he said, uh, Take courage, Master Ridley, and play the man, for today we are going to light a candle in England that I trust will never be put out. Something like that. It's a great, great uh, you know, statement. You can read about it in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, it, was just a, it was in April, uh, April 11th or April 10th, something like that. So that was, I just kind of showed up on my, on my feed the other day. Um, but, uh, but that, you know, I, I mentioned that to you because that ties in with what we're, what we're seeing here is that this is important. This is very, very important. Um, this is going beyond what Scripture gives us, adding to Scripture, and that's deadly. You know, that takes lives. Um, so Luther, now, in Luther's defense, he was being hyper-literal, um, woodenly literal, I would argue, when Jesus says, this is my body. There are other statements made in the New Testament, such as, um, I am the bread of life, I am the door, for the, I am the gate for the sheep, right? Um, you can think of other ones, I am the vine, um, that we don't interpret we interpret it metaphorically, and we understand that that is not um, doing what Origen did or Augustine did and going off the rails into um, fantasy land, but that the, the normal grammar of Scripture involves metaphor. And you can, you know, we, we use many examples. You can say things in normal English language, such as, um, I'm stuffed. You had a big meal? I'm stuffed. Oh, is he literally made out of foam and cotton? No. Okay? That's, that's wooden literalism that we need to reject um, in most cases. Um, and so when Jesus says, this is, this is my body, we can understand what he's saying there. And even I think, the, I think you'd have to be really um, obtuse to think the disciples were looking at him saying, that bread that he's holding right there is actually his body. This is his body, and this bread right here is his body too. We talked about John 6. The crowds rejected Jesus not because they thought they would have to literally cannibalize him when they said, you know, you have to eat me, you have to drink me to have life. But they understood what he was saying was, because of Hebrew idiom, because of metaphor, what he was saying was, um, you need to follow me and listen to my teachings and accept my teachings wholeheartedly. You need to eat the food that I give you, which, is, which are the words that I'm teaching you. And I, I think that it's clear in the text they're rejecting him on the basis of his teaching, not on this idea that they would have to cannibalize him. So, but that's the viewpoint that the Roman Catholics ended up taking. They'll use John 6 to defend this idea that it's actually his flesh, etc., um, let, let's pause right there. I, I know I'm talking a lot here, but any, any questions or comments at this point? <clears throat> yeah, Ron. Okay. Right. Right. It's amazing how just words like that, words like this, can be so confusing and create so much. And that that's when, you know, um, for the for the mic for those listening, um, you know, Ron brought up the point of. Um, people who say, do this in remembrance of me. Well, what does this mean? Does this mean the actual Passover meal? And there are um, Christians who are very interested in the Hebrew rituals, 
and bringing the Hebrew culture and the, of, into the Old Testament, of the Old Testament into the New Testament. And um, there are various groups like that, some of them heretical, not, some not so much. Um, but they'll say, okay, then Christians need to keep the Passover based on that. And they'll take that one verse and they'll strain that verse to its breaking point when there are plenty of other texts in the New Testament that say there's no expectation for Christians to keep the Sabbath. There's no, there's no expectation for them to hold to the Jewish rituals anymore because, you know, Titus was not circumcised. Um, Paul didn't tell Titus to be circumcised. He circumcised Timothy because he was half Jewish. Um, but Paul didn't, you know, in, in Jerusalem council, they didn't say the brothers need to be So there's all, the entire book of Galatians, you know, all these books are written about not bringing uh, those things back. So I think it, it often betrays, they might say, well, see, this verse says it. And they're straining a single verse to the point it, it just doesn't, it can't hold any, any weight under it um, because it's so pulled out of proportion, you know. Um, so to those people, like, sometimes there's no arguing. I think Zwingli thought that with Luther. I can't argue with this guy anymore. He's just saying, this is my body. And you reach that point in the argument where there's just, okay, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Um, I consider you a brother. You may not consider me a brother, but you know, in the end, the Lord will sort all that out, and we'll feast and joy at the Lord's table together. Um, for Luther, if I'm in Luther's position, I'm, I, I should be scared. I think I would be scared. Did I just consign my brother to hell because he had a a, a different interpretation of a non-gospel essential, or has? His view of the Lord's Supper moved, started moving into the primary doctrine category, where now that's where the Roman Catholics are. And if you, if you don't believe our view of the Lord's Supper, you're a heretic and we burn you. So that's, that's why we have to be really jealous to guard the primary truths of Scripture and not add to the Word of God. Um, because when those things start filtering in, um, you, know, you, get, you get the book of Galatians, you get heresy, you get people executing each other in the name of Christ. Tom, yeah. Right. 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 Absolutely, yeah. And I'm glad you segued us into that, too, because I don't want to neglect the, the second part of this, which is, or the third part, which is, this is more than a meal. We could say it's, it's the if this were a sermon, we might say the first half is, it's just a meal, and the second half, it might be, it's more than a meal. <laughs> and we hold those two things in tension. Um, because in the first sign, this is not a, uh, a mystical ritual. It's not an incantation. It's nothing pagan. I believe the Roman Catholic view is uh, pagan or right on the line of pagan um, because it exalts this uh, entity, this physical created thing. Let's not forget that bread and, and wine are no different than sticks and logs and bricks and gold and metal. They're, those are things that God has created. And the entire Old Testament almost is God, um, you know, um, judging Israel. I shouldn't say the entire, but a large, large percentage of the Old Testament is God judging Israel for what they do with this created matter and how they treat it. And in even we, we use the example of the snake on the pole because they had turned that, that snake that God commanded them to make that would bring healing to them when they were bitten by the snakes. He, they turned that snake on the pole into uh, an idol that they were worshiping. And could we not then just as easily, I would say we in general as humans, 
turn the Lord's Supper into an idolatrous practice. Absolutely. And if you ask the Roman Catholic, what, what would constitute idolatry of the Mass, uh, of, the, of the bread and the wine? What, what line would you cross where that would become idolatrous? I think they would struggle to answer that. Uh, because it is the very flesh and blood of Christ, so why wouldn't you worship it? Um, but, so it's, it's, it's only a meal, but it's, it's more than a normal meal. And in verse 27, we know that because he says, whoever eats this or drinks this um, in an unworthy manner. Now that, we could talk about all the things associated with that. But how, the, how that is judged is a person judging himself, his conscience examining himself. There is not a rule book um, that, that indicates uh, this is what constitutes um, an unworthy manner. But there's so much in Scripture that um, will show us what hypocrisy looks like. But whoever does that will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. So, yeah, you, when you approach the Lord's table, you have um, a, a great weight on your shoulders. You have a great responsibility in one sense, to um, do this in a proper way and to take it lightly. It's better for you not to take it if you're not sure where your salvation is. We often say that. Um, better not to take it. Don't, don't, uh, don't deceive yourself and don't be deceived by others. Yeah, John. <clears throat> sure. Mm-hmm. Right. They have the same words every time. Um, there's a place in the church for r- ritual acts, repeated things. Um, but we should always approach that with a, an idea t- toward, um, or with a mind toward refreshing ourselves in the same old truth every, every time. And I think it's good for us who plan and put together the worship service, our collective worship, to consider um, those sort of repeated beats each time, but also having new content, having new ideas. You know, if Dave just got up here and, and preached uh, Charles Spurgeon sermon every week, there's probably enough of those to last a lifetime. Um, and would the gospel be preached? Yes. Would you be edified? Most likely. But you would also understand you would see a person who's not actually bringing his own sacrifice, you know. And so what we do is we bring our sacrifice of praise, as the, New Test- as the Old Testament says. We bring it in the house of the Lord. We bring um, what, we ha- what God has given us with our unique abilities and gifts, and we br- bring and present that to the Lord. Um, and, and as that relates to the Lord's Supper, there, there's a ritualistic element to it, but also we're the real sac- I should say the real sacrifice that God honors and loves is when you bring your repentant heart to that, to that Lord's Supper and confess your sins and acknowledge his... That's all of that real meat, no pun intended, of the, of the ritual is happening invisibly between you and God. And we can look outwardly and see the externalities, but... All we're seeing is this shell of it, and we're not seeing the real content, which is what's inside the heart. And God knows, and he judges that. And I think Paul's saying, you need to judge yourself first so that um, you don't, you're not deceived, and you're not deceiving, and you're also not blaspheming God by making a mockery of, of, of what this is supposed to be. Yeah, Chris. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you look at the text, when you kind of stand back from the text, don't get so um, tunnel visioned on this that you see this is my body, but you stand back and say, okay, what, what is the Lord's Supper according to this? Well, it's a fellowship meal, 
It's more than a meal, um, but it's also um, it's a time of it's a time of self examination. It should be a time of self uh, of of um, and and not just that. Okay, I'm just going to examine myself 30 seconds a, a month when we do the communion, but it should be the result of it's it's sort of the uh, the result of your sanctification that entire month, and you're bringing that to the Lord and saying, you know, I remember how much I've sinned this week or this month, however however long it's been, and I, I repent of that, and I confess that to you, and I, I, I'm thankful for your forgiveness, and I remember that this blood was shed for me once in the past, and it's all taken care of. But I'm doing this again because I forget. Yeah, Tom. <clears throat> Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Um, and and even we see that. The result, the immediate result in the, in the apostolic church, um, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So, I, you know, we, you don't really see people dropping dead anymore um, for taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Does God still uh, afflict punishments? I don't know. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know um, if he does that. As, but I think it's not, it's not an Ananias and Sapphira type way. That was undeniable. Peter even said, this is what's happening. The Lord's going to judge you for this. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a different discussion. We, we also preach, Dave and I preach through 1 Corinthians, so um, we can find that, that there, or we can discuss that another day. Um, so, it, you know, I think that's the big picture view of it, is that it is a time of self-examination. Now, can you examine yourself if the Mass is in a language you don't speak? Can you examine yourself if you don't have the Word of God, if they don't if the priest is not reading the word of God to you, he's just telling you this is, this is the body, you take this. And, you know, Catholics will say, well, you know, our doctrine has, it's very complex, there's a lot of gray in there, um, but the, the, the lay people couldn't read it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't have the Bible. And so they're showing up at church, many of them illiterate, and also not hearing the Bible preached in their language. And they're seeing this and just, and I think it's true today as well, even if the mass is in a language other than Latin that they can understand, they really have no idea what's going on. You talk to former Catholics who are lifelong Catholics, um, many of them just have no clue what the Lord's Supper is all about because they've never read this before. Um, so, um, Let's do a look at a few more texts here, and then we'll, we'll wrap this all up. So some of those questions uh, in 6 were answered here. Is Christ specially present? I would maintain that, you know, wherever we are, there the fullness of Christ is if we have his Holy Spirit. I really resist any term of real presence. A lot of Protestants will use that, like Presbyterians and Lutherans will use a language of real presence when you take the sacrament. I don't like the word sacrament personally. Uh, but it, this is not an issue of salvation or not. Uh, this is, these are just, I think, unhelpful or dangerous terms that lead to, or, towards a mystical view of what we're doing here. Um, oddly, even though Presbyterians might be very anti-charismatic, oddly a lot of charismatics have kind of the same view, that the Lord's Supper brings down the presence of God in a special way that other things don't. Um, I think we need to hold to what Scripture tells us, which is that the Lord is with you always till the end of the age, and he doesn't come and go. In the Old Testament, it was, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, Psalm 51, right? Um, the Spirit would come down on Saul, and then he would depart. Come down on Samson and depart. Um, and even, even for the average Christian in the Old Testament, there was a special presence of God in Israel at the temple, and that's why they would go and make it make their pilgrimage, and they would go to Israel to be in the presence of the Lord. And David could say, 
um, how my soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord where your presence dwells. There was a special presence, and we're told that presence is now completely within us. Um, so I think we need to be really careful about this idea of a special presence or a real presence. Um, who examines the believer and makes him fit for participation? That's the individual. Uh, there's been an old Protestant view called fencing the table, and some Protestant churches have closed communion, some have open communion. This is another great uh, sort of segue that we could get into, tangent, but um, we don't fence the table um, because it's, the scripture says examine yourself. So what fencing the table is, the, elder, the elders would keep a role of who is officially um, allowed to take communion and who is not. And if you're a visitor to the church, uh, you would have to maybe have a letter of, you know, transmission from your elder if, if you're visiting the church saying he's allowed to take communion or something. This is very popular in New England uh, during the Puritan era, and in some churches it still is. Uh, Calvin w was um, very much in favor of fencing the table. Um, that was, as we study the Reformation, we'll see that that was um, also connected with this idea of your citizenship in the, in the city-state of Geneva. And so you, if you were a citizen, you were a Christian, and therefore you should be taking the Lord's Supper. But as Edward says, I think Tom pointed this out last week, um, Jonathan Edward comes along and he has, he has all these people who are baptized as infants, and they're enrolled in, as a member in the church, and they're all taking communion, but they're all living like the world. And he's like, we can't do this anymore. This, something, something got off track here. So we just, at Lakeview, we just leave the table open, and we say, but we warn you and say, we examine, examine yourself. Parents should, um, you know, guide their children into doing this, and that we should have liberty in Christ as far as that goes. Um, so one parent may not want their children taking communion until they're 18, and we can respect that. Another might say, you know, if your child's baptized, they should take communion. Um, uh, in some cases, maybe you're not baptized, but you take communion anyway. And there, there are instances of that. So we have to have a lot of leeway there because where the Bible doesn't speak, as John Calvin says, we need to lay our hands over our mouths. Be really, really cautious about where, you, where we tread. That's, if nothing else, take that away from, from this study. You know, is So many of these heresies are deriving from going beyond what is written in the Bible and create in adding your preference, your um, interpretation and in making that dogma. So uh, let the man examine himself when he approaches the table, sufficient to say. Um, <clears throat> and I think children can examine themselves uh, beyond a certain age. Um, so we talked about the ritual sacrifice. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy 4. We talked about what is the center of our worship rather than the Lord's Supper. The center of our worship service is what Paul charged Timothy, the elder, with doing when he's commissioning him to, um, to take over the church that he's planted. So you know this pretty well. Um, I'm just going to read two verses here. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The way that some churches are structured, you would think Paul had told Timothy, I charge you, administer the sacraments. I mean, honestly, the way even some Protestant churches are, are set up, that is the main event. And the preaching is a sideline, a side event. Um, some denominations preach for 10 to 15 minutes. And they, they consider themselves theologically very orthodox. And they do check a lot of the boxes, justification by faith alone, you know, et cetera. Uh, but they have to have so much space in their liturgy for, uh, for the Eucharist service and for other things like uh, the priest blessing people, elaborate blessings, elaborate incantations, um, re recitations of scripture, which is fine. Um, you know, people repeating the scripture, the public reading of scripture is great. All of that is good. But what is at the heart and soul of it is the teaching, the expositing, the opening of the word. And we can make a strong case for that from what Jesus did, from what they did in the synagogues. Jesus stood up and preached 
and explain the word to the people. And that's how they were blessed and that's how they grew. And they sang hymns together and they took the Lord's Supper, but it was the preaching um, that was centered to everything. So that's why Paul tells Timothy. Paul doesn't mention anything to the elders that he writes to, interestingly, about administering the sacraments. And, you know, arguments from silence can be shaky, but that's a strong argument from silence because the New Testament has a lot of instructions to pastors, to elders, and there's nothing in there about administering the sacraments. He speaks to the Corinthians as a whole church and says, when you meet together, plural, brothers. He doesn't instruct the elders on how they should wear these elaborate vestments and robes and here's the ceremony that you need to have. He doesn't explain saying, you know, this, this transubstantiation, when, when the wafer turns into flesh, then you ring a bell, go behind the curtain so that people know this. now there's a separation between God and man. Um, none of this. So preach the word. Um, John 17, 17, you don't need to turn there, but he says, sanctify them by the truth, right? Not sanctify them by the, the meal, the, the blood and the flesh. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And we read the definition of the, <clears throat> in the Catholic Catechism that they said the community and the, the communion is caused by the Eucharist. It's caused by that, not caused by the preaching of the word. Uh, this one is important, 1 Timothy 2.5. <clears throat> the, as a, we talk about the Catholic Church is moving, has been moving the last few decades to make Mary co-redeemer with Christ. Um, I don't know how much clearer Paul could have been in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. Now, anticipating their argument, yes, we have elders who can mediate the word of God to you and bless you through the preaching of the word. Um, You might even say they can bless you through the administering of the Lord's Supper. We don't just say, you know, we don't have anybody give up, get up and give the Lord's Supper. Uh, But there is a responsibility there for the person giving it as well as receiving it. Um, But that is a far cry from saying that the elder now is a mediator between God and man. That elder needs a mediator. He's taking, in our church, he's taking that juice and that bread right along with you, as one of you. Um, He's standing before the Lord not as a mediator, but as a sinner. And that is a very important distinction to make. Um, Look at the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament properly, unlike what they did, uh, that priest was making atonement on behalf of the sins of Israel, but he, he, he was making atonement for himself. His blood uh, was being sprinkled on that, um, or I should say, the blood was being sprinkled on that, on that uh, altar for him as well. So there was, a, there was a, a, a very conscious understanding of that. And the priests met with severe judgment if they were ever to move into a position where they thought they were the mediator. Um, Look at what happened to the king who moved into the sanctuary to offer himself as a, as a mediator. So, <clears throat> um, suffice it to say. And then Hebrews 10, 10 through 18. Um, this, this really, we could probably end with this. I have a few extra quotes there uh, that you can see from the Catholics about, and I would encourage you to read those. Um, just for the sake of uh, discernment. But you can see those quotes from from the Catholics there um, that they're they're essentially saying the priest, he is a God, small g, God. He is a God living and walking on earth, a God by grace and by participation, clothed with the perfections and attributes of God, blah, 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 blah. They're they're making the priest to be an altar Christus, which means another Christ who will... um, present the sacrifice on your behalf. We have one mediator, so let's close with Hebrews 10, 11 through 18. And it says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So that's another problem. The Catholics say these, these things can take away sins. But he's saying the Old Testament priests that you're, you're mimicking, they, they were not efficacious. 
They were enough to stay God's wrath and to keep his wrath away from Israel and to satisfy and to appease him, but they weren't taking away the sins of the people. Only God did that through Christ. Verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time, both before and after, they're not two ways of salvation, but before and after, there's one way of salvation. Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. And that's where he is right now. He's waiting in heaven until the time comes to make uh, his enemies a footstool. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So there's no representation. There's no bloodless sacrifice that, that should be made. Uh, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to this, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. You don't go into a Catholic church and hear your sins were once for all taken away and he doesn't remember them anymore. You hear, you need to keep coming. You need to keep taking this until you die, and then you need to have the last, last rites done on you. And even then, we'll see. You know, there's purgatory, there's limbo for children who die in infancy, and then we'll see what happens, you know. Um, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin, verse 18. There, so when we get together, as Tom said, this is a memorial, it's not an offering. The offering um, takes place in our hearts. We are the living sacrifices. Our hearts are what is being given uh, to God. And the bread and the cup are just reminders of what happened once and happened for all. So any closing, uh, we have a few minutes here. Any closing thoughts or questions on that? And all of that, they will have an argument for. <laughs> but uh, we walk by faith, and we, we know, as we're going to sing this morning, we have blessed assurance. The Roman Catholic has no assurance of their salvation, not really, um, because will they die in a state of mortal sin or venial sin? Will they die having committed a sin that is beyond forgiveness? Will they spend the next 300 million years in purgatory? They don't have assurance that when they die, they will be with the Lord immediately and forever. So that's a sad place to be. And, um, and that comes from, once again, that comes from adding to the word of God. Um, and we want to be very, very careful when we do that. So, all right, let's.